as I'm making my way up to the podium, take a minute and look around the room and find someone who you don't know and look at them. What are, what are their likes and dislikes? How about their family history? Did they grow up in a privileged household or were they poor? What kind of a mother did they have? Can you tell by looking at them? Are they employed, retired, underemployed? Have they ever broken the law? You're probably thinking, what is he getting at, right? Silly exercise. How could you know these things about somebody you've never met? It's, it's not possible. At best, you could maybe guess that they were Jewish. It's probably a safe bet in this community. You might presume they're Ashkenazi or Sephardic or Persian, but you could be wrong. You might, have, you might be able to discern their fashion sense. That is, if you have one of your own. Maybe you could tell if they're bored or connected or spiritually uplifted, but that's probably about all you could tell by looking at them. And yet, that is exactly what we do almost every day of the week, several times a day. We pass judgment about people we look at and we know very little about. We size up clients who enter our business. Are these people spenders or are they just wasting my time? Is this a business deal I want to get into? Can I trust this person? Will this person, if you're a doctor, will this person be cooperative and compliant or is this going to be one of those, you know? You see someone unfamiliar walking by outside your home. Does he belong in my neighborhood or should I call the police? How does he look? How does she look? You size them up. It's your child's first day at school, the new teacher. Is this teacher going to get my kid, you're thinking to yourself? You haven't met the person before, but you're trying to figure it out based on first impressions. How often have you heard someone say this phrase? I have a hunch about her. I have a hunch about him. And the internal dialogue must go something like this. All of us have done this, right? I can tell by the way he dresses. I just don't trust him. Or how about, I can tell by the way she looks. She'd make a good friend. I just don't like the way he looks. I can tell this isn't going to go well. Or how about, I know his type. He's one of those bleeding heart liberals. I'll bet he's all about high taxes and government spending. Or I know her type. She's one of those crazy conservatives. I'll bet she's ready to get the U.S. into another war and thinks global warming is a hoax. How many of you were thinking, even as I said that, yeah, he's right. I can figure people out like that. Well, here's the problem. Decades of neuropsychology and, and studies of neuroscience have proven that our intuition is almost always dead wrong. Dead wrong. Because we are incredibly irrational, impulsive beings. We jump to conclusions and we're biased by all sorts of irrelevant considerations. So if that's the case, stop it. Just don't do it anymore. Impossible, right? I might as well talk, tell you to stop breathing. That's what we do. We judge people like that. We size them up. Two scientists in Israel have literally written the books on this topic. Daniel Kahneman was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work. His book is called Thinking Fast and Slow. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. And what Kahneman discovers and reveals is that our brains are basically lazy, really lazy. That no they take whatever information happens to be readily available and use it to make decisions, no matter how irrelevant it is. In an astounding study, Kahneman and his associates did, a, they studied judges in Israel who were making decisions about parole. And they found that these judges were actually less likely to grant parole when they were hungry or tired. The state of the, the criminal had nothing to do with whether the crime, whatever the crime was, how, long, how much time they served, how they behaved in prison. That wasn't in the determining factor. These people whose job it was to judge really literally used their kishkas to judge. The second scientist is Daniel Ariely. He's an Israeli-trained professor of behavioral economics. He worked at MIT, and now he's at Duke. And his book is called Predictably Irrational. 
7.8 million viewers have watched his TED Talk. And on that talk, he tells us that basically, we aren't cool calculators of self-interest who sometimes go crazy. We're actually crazies who, under special circumstances, are sometimes rational. 7.8 million people watched him and said, mm-hmm, that's me. Here it is in his own words. He said, we usually think of ourselves as sitting in the driver's seat with ultimate control over the decisions we make and the direction our lives take. But alas, this perception has more to do with our desires, with how we want to view ourselves, than with reality. In one experiment, he actually zapped patients with electricity and offered them fake pain pills to lessen the pain. The people who were told that the pills cost more found that the pills worked better. <laughs> what were the pills? Cornstarch. And here's what makes it even more confounding about we human beings. Even though we know, now you know, that we, stick to, we, we reach these conclusions often irrationally, we stick to them even when we're confronted with evidence to the contrary. So if you think your spouse is the most stubborn person on this planet, or your children, guess again. We all are. That's what we do. And if you're sitting here doubting every decision you ever made in your life, that's what these books do to you. But don't worry, I'm staying married. So I don't doubt that decision. So here's the bottom line. This tendency to rush to judgment and to base our conclusions on evidence that really is not related to the circumstances often, I think, is the root cause of some of the nastiness, hostility, and animosity and anger that pervades our society. We are deluged by news clips, by talking heads, by shocking images. And often, the information we're getting thrown at us from the media is incorrect. But we've got to make a quick decision, because we're going to move on to the next thing. So we reach conclusions, and we figure out the world, and we base them on, do I trust this particular source of information? Does he or she look honest? Does this information sound right, based on how my irrational brain is going to judge things right now? And we judge others using that information. And here's what I think. I think the more different a person is from us, the more likely we're going to pass negative, hostile, or unforgiving judgment on them. We judge black faces. We judge brown faces. We judge Democrats, Republicans. We judge cops and soldiers and government officials. And we judge people based on their opinions about Israel. We judge people based about whether or not their religion is the same as ours. We judge people who are in jail. We judge people who've been in jail. The words we're going to read next week in the prayer book are actually more correct now, scientists tell us, than we might even have thought at first. We are indeed judgmental, narrow-minded. We deny, we lie, we slander. That's what we do. What's missing, and what we don't do enough of, is offer empathy. Empathy. That's the ability to see into another person's heart. Not rushing to judge, but to actually take the time to understand and to listen. Now, there are times when we do it pretty well. We open our hearts quite easily to the needs of our spouses, our children, our friends. We support them with all of our hearts and our abilities. How many of us have rushed to the bedside of a friend and held their hand and really felt their pain as we offered them comfort? How many of us have gone to the funeral of the relative of a friend, or perhaps even a friend, and shed tears at the funeral in empathy with the family as they were mourning? That's empathy for people who we know and who are close to us. But when those who cry out are different from us, well, then we have a much tougher time. In fact, sometimes our empathy completely fails us. I mean, think about those images that we saw of black people protesting in cities throughout the country. How difficult might it have been for us to feel the pain of poverty, the ravages of living in crime-infested neighborhoods, of trying to learn in failed schools? Did their claims of racial justice resonate, racial injustice resonate with us? How difficult is it for us to feel the pain of Latin American immigrants who cross those forbidding borders and deserts 
How well do we understand what drives a child to ride on the top of a freight car out of Guatemala through Mexico to the American border? Or a mother to walk with her child on her back across the Rio Grande? You know, our empathy kicks into overdrive when they're close to us. But when they're different, when we can't understand their lives, when we don't understand their circumstances, that's when our empathy is lacking. Now here's the thing. We're Jewish. And the Jewish tradition is not neutral on empathy. It doesn't suggest we feel it. It doesn't give us an option to be empathic. Jewish tradition actually commands empathy. Every year we sit around the Passover Seder, the most widely observed ritual in every Jewish household. We root through the Haggadah, we eat the matzah, we shed tears over the hottest horseradish we've ever had. Why? To remember the Exodus? Of course. But why are we sitting there remembering the Exodus? Because of these words. V'ger lo tilchatz v'yadatem et nefesh ha'ger ki gerim ha'item be'eretz Mitzrayim. You shall not oppress a stranger. For you know the feeling of a stranger, having yourselves been strangers in the land of Israel, of Egypt, land of Egypt, excuse me. The entire Seder, the storytelling, and yes, the horseradish, the salt water, the haroset, all of that is designed to boost our empathy. That's why we do it. In fact, we're commanded to remember that we're slaves in Egypt every Shabbat, every Sukkot, Every Simchat Torah, every, sorry, every Shavuot, we're commanded to remember that we're slaves in Egypt. And who are those strangers we're commanded to be most empathic for? The ones who are least like us. The ones for whom it's least easy to muster empathy. There's a classic story from Jewish antiquity about a heathen, a non-Jew, a Greek, a pagan, who appears before the great Rabbi Hillel and mocks him and says, all right, Teach me the entire Torah while I stand on one foot. Does Rabbi Hillel kick him out? He doesn't. He says, the whole Torah, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. That's the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Zilgamar, go and learn. So he captures the entire Torah in one sentence. And what's the core of that sentence? Empathy. Caring for another person. It's the Jewish version of the golden rule. It's so central to Judaism that the Israeli Ministry of Education has made empathy its core pedagogic approach for the next several years. So every school child in Israel is going to learn about empathy. The the heading, the slogan they've given this mission is Hacher Hu Ani, I am the other. Israel's a country of 8 million people. There are literally in Israel Jews of every color. And yet Ethiopian Jews, black Jews, are at the bottom of the social ladder. There are Jews from every denomination, every subset of every denomination. And yet the Orthodox throw stones at the secular, and the secular mock the Orthodox. There are immigrants from every continent. And yet there are 45,000 Africans in Israel today, 2,000 of whom are detained in the camp, and the others who can't achieve citizenship rights. Members of nearly every religious community exist in Israel and the world. And there's barely any social interaction between those communities. Here's what the Israeli Ministry of Education said about society in Israel. Israeli society is marked by incidents of racism, violence, and incitement in the public sphere and social networks. The Jewish nation, 75 years after the Holocaust, is struggling with its own version of racism. That's an astounding state of affairs. So what the Ministry of Education did is to take on the problem head on, to build a curriculum for every school, for every kid. I am the other. Sometimes we are the same, sometimes we are different, but we are always equal. See, the Israeli Ministry of Education refuses to accept the status quo that arises out of that human decision, that human, that human propensity to make snap decisions. We have a banner hanging outside on the field where our children play. It says ha'acher hu'ani on it. So compelling, we've made it one of the pedagogic priorities in our own schools. Because empathy is a Jewish value, and a Jewish school must teach empathy. Next week for Yom Kippur, 
we're going to sit and listen to one of the most compelling prayers in our liturgy. Shema Kolenu, we're going to say. Hear our voice. It's a cry, a plaintive cry from deep within to God. Hear us. Understand us, God. We try, but we fail. You have to understand my situation, God. You know, I'm imperfect. I'm flawed. I have all these other factors that draw me away from what I need to be doing. God, you'll understand, right? The reason we're asking that of God is because we expect it of ourselves. Shema Kolenu. We need to listen to the voices of our fellows. Let me make this concrete. In August of 2014, Mike Brown was shot dead by a police officer a year ago. He was unarmed. Within days, hundreds of people were protesting in the streets, and their protests soon ignited that Black Lives Matter movement. Now, we don't understand the phrase often until we're able to listen to Mike Brown's mother. And here's what she said at her son's funeral. You took my son away from me. Do you know how hard it was for me to get him to stay in school and graduate? Do you know how many black men graduate? Not many. Because you bring them down to this type of level where they feel like they don't get nothing to live for anyway. This isn't a call to violence. This is not just a mother's cry of pain. This is a community's cry of pain, a community that dwells among us. Shema Kolenu, she's pleading, hear our voice. In a recent article in Time magazine, Karim Abdul-Jabbar responded to those who say all lives matter in response to black lives matter. He says, and he says, we need to understand this chant this way. We'd like to create a country in which black lives matter as much as white lives in terms of physical safety education and job opportunities, criminal prosecution and political power. He goes on to say, in not so many words, Shema Kolenu, black lives matter isn't just a metaphor. It's a call for awareness of the literal danger to one's physical body merely by being black in America, a danger that whites don't share. Now, this is from a man, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who is more likely to be asked by a cop for his autograph than given a ticket. This guy has face recognition. And I'm not asking you to agree with him. And I'm not asking you to even to be a supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement. All I'm asking you to do is, is to extend them a modicum of empathy. To ask yourself, what does it mean for this to be something said in our community today? Start with concern and compassion instead of with judgment. 75 years ago, we experienced the complete and total failure of the world's empathy. People were deaf and dumb and blind to the suffering of Jews. Nations closed their doors. So it's on us to overwhelm the world with our empathy today, to resist the overwhelming instinct that we have as human beings to rush to judgment, to rush to condemn, to belittle, to be callous, to be narrow-minded, to lack compassion, to fight the urge to presume we know the motivations and characters of the other. It's on us because of who we are, to listen to the voice of the stranger. Because we've been commanded to know that stranger's heart. And when we do our best to know the heart of the stranger, when we do our best to know the heart of the mother who lost her child in a routine traffic stop, to know the heart of the immigrant who risked walking across a forbidding desert, to know the heart of a child who must struggle in a classroom with 35 children, and walk home through gang-infested neighborhoods, and to know the heart of the cop's family who has to bury him after he's been gunned down while putting gas in his car. Shema Kolenu. They're all calling out to us. They're crying out to us to listen, to care, to be moved, to act. We, of all people, the Jews, we can't turn our backs when others cry out to us. Because we dare to believe, we dare to say that creating a better world starts right here and right now. It starts with us. Ken Hiratzon. So may it be. Amen.